Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very, very happy to welcome you all here to our conversation. It's a part three of an ongoing conversation of uh, Canvas Magazine. I'd like to thank very much Ali and Alia, um, uh, as well as uh, Silvia and Aurelia, uh, uh, and basically immediately start uh, by actually introducing our uh, speakers, Kara Amer, Kara Atia, and Akram Zatari. Uh, there is a flyer which you all should get where you have CVs and informations uh, on the three artists. We are incredibly thankful uh, that they've all accepted to come to Miami and uh, be um, on this panel. Uh, we're going to address some of the topics which are announced and also some other topics we discussed this morning at the uh, breakfast, new topics which kind of uh, popped up. Um, and I'd like also like to emphasize that actually this three-part panel is going to become a book. Uh, so all the three uh, panels together will form a book which is going to come out uh, uh, very soon. But before we begin, uh, there's maybe a kind of a, pr a prelude or a preamble we wanted to somehow address. Uh, and that has to do really with uh, geography. And um, there are many panels, uh, exhibitions, conferences worldwide at the moment uh, having to do with uh, the Middle East. And whenever we are on a panel related to the Middle East, uh, there is this sort of discomfort about this uh, uh, description. Uh, as of recently, for example, last week in Abu Dhabi, uh, Jack Persekian and several other speakers said that they thought it was a, a colonial notion, something also the poet Etel Adnan emphasized, that we should stop uh, using it because it somehow undermines, as Etel said, maybe the heterogeneity of uh, what is uh, somehow reality of all these different contexts and all these different cities uh, and places. Um, several other uh, proposals have also been rejected. Uh, for example, Etel Adnan thought we could maybe use Mashrek and Maghreb, but today at the breakfast, uh, uh, that was rejected uh, immediately. Uh, and uh, so I was just wondering to maybe start with this um, geographical uh, belonging or non-belonging, uh, if maybe uh, you could all say a little bit about, about this. Shall I start? Yeah. I think, I think you uh, start to designate or to name um, a region because of its difference. And that it's, so, so we're starting from a problematic uh, hypothesis. Um, the, the, the failure of all, 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 all of these uh, notions, in my opinion, um, is due to the fact that it's often confusing administrative uh, reasons with cultural characteristics. And I think, um, like, the U.S. Department of State would designate certain area as the Islamic world because of administrative reasons, or would designate um, an area like the Middle East because of that, too. Once we, when, once we take these notions and apply them and uh, uh, expect that those regions would have common then it, characteristics, then it, be, it would start to have like serious implications on culture. No, I, I don't have a problem with the terminology because uh, we have to name things, so Middle East is one name. I don't have a problem. I, I have more of a problem of uh, uh, just separation. But uh, as a terminology, I, 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 for me, it's not interesting. I cover. I mean, I was speaking about the, the notion of uh, non-Occidental area that would be more to refer to Edouard Said and how he used to describe the Orient, uh, an area from Rabat to Tokyo. And then I would include Africa also. So you just... Now one other thing... Yeah, maybe if, if I would just elaborate on, 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 on what I have said. For example, Europe have recently uh, s started to designate um, uh, the region. It's like the Le, Le, Le Bassin Méditerranéen. It's like the Mediterranean area. Basically to um, 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 send funds to the southern uh, side of them uh, and, and encourage collaboration and therefore imagine that this area will, be, will have a kind of unity, which in reality, politically, would never um, um, happen because Europe is still close to the working class coming from North Africa, for example. It's still, I mean, op it opens from time to time, but it's still close to, uh, to that kind of mobility. So, so I, I really don't know um, uh, where all these definitions are leading to, but uh, uh, art institutions have failed, in my opinion, to come up with their own uh, uh, denomination. Now, during our breakfast, I then at a certain moment came up with the uh, notion of the city, because I mean, one of the things which is obviously a possibility to scale it down is to say art from Beirut, art from uh, Cairo, art from uh, different cities that we sort of 
don't have any large or maybe regional or uh, national kind of identities. I mean, Anderson said that even nations are always imaginary constructs and that we maybe more look at art scenes in different cities and then a disagreement broke out. So maybe we should come back to that idea of the city. Is the city an entity you're comfortable with? Well, I'm, I'm maybe the only one who lives in, uh, in the city I'm born in, uh, in and I, I live in Beirut. So, uh, and Beirut has a very uh, uh, specific um, um, history when it comes to contemporary art because my generation is the post-war uh, generation who, and we're talking about different art practices that were born in the 90s completely away from a market and it was slowly uh, introduced into a market in the, in the year 2003-2005. So, uh, uh, and, and that, um, the, the kind of questions that were raised in my generation were, are, are, have a strong um, a relationship to um, evidence, to documents, to constitution of archives, to uh, the power structures within archives. Or, so, and this is a unique situation that's, uh, that w which I can't see uh, taking place outside a city like um, like Beirut. So in this case, yes, I do belong to a Beirut scene as opposed to a Lebanon scene. I do, be, I do belong to a Beirut scene as opposed to a Middle Eastern or an, an Arab scene. But I, 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 don't, I don't belong to any particular city because I, uh, contrary to, I have traveled and lived in many, many cities. So I don't, cannot say, okay, I'm from Cairo, I'm from Nice, I'm from Paris, I'm from Algeria, I'm from where? Maybe from New York would be the best if I have to choose a city, but uh, I, I uh, have a problem with identifying or with a, a land or a continent or a, or a region or uh, I, I feel, I, I don't feel that I can. That's all. Kader? Yeah, I mean, either, I mean, I think uh, all of us have a different experience. I mean, according to me, the, the way that I uh, grew up in between France and Algeria create me, um, I mean, inspire me in my work as something that is how to take, how to, care, how to care more about what is in between than in the both side. So I'm always, you know, in this, in this in-betweenness. Yeah, it's something, again, Etel Adnan, the great poet, she says identity is shifty, identity um, is a choice. One other topic uh, important to address um, is uh, censorship. Uh, now, uh, Doris Lessing, in a recent conversation I had with her, she said censorship is one thing, but very often we should not forget that there is also self-censorship. Uh, so maybe in her case, as she told me, the books she didn't write, uh, uh, um, which she self-censored. I was somehow wondering if you could talk a little bit about censorship. I mean, I know that certain of your works, for example, Gada's Encyclopedia of Pleasure, um, has had uh, censorship. Kara uh, um, was saying that actually, um, uh, certain of his works would be difficult to be shown in the, uh, in the Arab world. So at the same time, uh, it's maybe also difficult to say that censorship only happens in the East because censorship can happen anywhere. So let's talk about censorship. Yeah, I, um, for example, I got censorship uh, in, uh, New York, in America, in New York, actually, believe it or not, and in Panama, and of course in the Middle East. And each one is for different works and for uh, a different uh, aspect of the work. And it's not always about sexuality, uh, but it's political. Panama was a political work that I did and it got censored. Um, Encyclopedia of Pleasure got censored uh, because of, for uh, like, it, it, and then it depends how do you censor. It's like you don't want the piece, you, you ask, they asked for me to do a piece and I was doing this piece and it was Encyclopedia of Pleasure. And then they didn't want it because of the content, because it's a public space. And then you cannot uh, go. You, you you don't go to the museum, so you pay a fee. And then there is this uh, 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 like a, um, sign saying that this work contains sexual con uh, like uh, elements. And in Egypt, of course, I uh, censorship. It, you know, I showed in Egypt twice, and I showed my uh, um, that my erotic pieces, which uh, in a, um, in a govern gov governmental context would have been censored. So. Uh, censorship is, is something you have to kind of to deal with. Uh, so uh, I showed in Egypt because it was in a private space in the second uh, floor of a building, a uh, private gallery. So it was by appointment, but everybody know, knows it. And uh, we were talking as well about, uh, anyway, internet now. 
So it's. Uh, and can you tell us more about the Encyclopedia of Pleasure? Because I thought that that was a very interesting example of a piece of yours. Uh, Encyclopedia of Pleasure is a. Um, well, it's it's a treatise of the Middle uh, Ages, Arabic treatise, uh, that uh, was written. Um, uh, in Arabic, and now it's, it's, it doesn't, it, it, it exists, but it's censored as a book. It's a book that starts like this, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which is in the, in the name of God. I'm gonna teach you how to be a better Muslim, and in order to be a better Muslim, you have to be a better human being. And in order to be a better human being, you have to be a better sexual being. So, and then this guy starts um, uh, this treatise, which I found interesting because it was putting sexuality and spirituality in one uh, in one uh, uh, place, so um, and because this book is it was censored and because it it was existing in Arabic, actually it's my sister who did this research. She's a specialist of the Middle Ages and all of this. So she uh, gave me the book. She had made uh, four years of re research to find the book, uh, and we found a translation in Canada uh, of a PhD that I actually had embroidered on uh, 54 boxes and I choose to embroider only the, the part uh, that speaks about woman's sexuality because I thought it was just very funny that a man just, already it was a funny book, but just uh, is like very theoret making theory about woman's sexuality. So this is w w this part that I chose to write. And Kata, when we met for the first time, was uh, actually in the, uh, in the late 90s, and you had just done your uh, uh, legendary piece, uh, The Landing Strip, and you told me earlier today that this piece, 10 years later, it would still be difficult to be shown in many parts of the world. Yes, indeed. I mean, the story is very interesting because actually uh, I've been invited twice to show in Algeria in the Museum uh, uh, of Modern Art and Contemporary Art, and so in a, in a public space. And uh, they told me, okay, you, we can show everything. Uh, most of your work accepted this one. And actually the, the issue of transsexuality and transgender issues in, uh, in Algeria is totally different than in other Arab country. Maybe it's more because uh, has Algeria for now 20 years have to deal with Islamic issues. Um, is something that is, uh, I mean, there is a kind of paradox situation. There's people say, especially the transsexual I, I, I filmed, they told me, in Algeria, you can do whatever you want, but don't make politics. And this work, The Landing Strip, is not about sexuality, actually. It's about politics. It's more referring in a way that uh, the story of sexuality of Michel Foucault teach us how sexuality is a political issue. And Especially because finally you see men that are dressing as, as, as women and trying to keep the, the tradition. That leads us also to uh, Akram because you said uh, earlier we should talk about sex and uh, uh, that's um, maybe another topic. You've not only uh, exhibited worldwide and been extremely involved at the same time in Beirut, also in curatorial activities. So I think last year you curated uh, an exhibition there. And um, you've told me in previous conversations that there is a sort of a difference between these things happening, for example, in Beirut, in a sort of a private context, and then what would happen in a public museum? Sure. Well, first, uh, I think we all know uh, that censorship is a very smart or organism. So uh, uh, it, it uh, tries to, uh, um, to convince the public that it's actually defending um, the, the rights of an individual. So uh, it, it tries to convince religious authorities, for example, that it's defending religions. Um, but in fact, it's just like any power um, uh, um, organism, it's after power. What it aims is to control as opposed to to defend. So f from there on, I, I, in my experience, if you shy away from censorship, if you, if you accept to, uh, that your work is um, uh, diffused in a specific context and not, in, on, not on television, not uh, uh, films for theatrical release, for example, you can easily escape censorship and as if you turn your back to it. All of my, uh, of, all of my films were never sent to the censorship of office to get a license for theatrical uh, um, uh, diffusion. And none of them were, were sent as a script because in Lebanon and like in many Middle Eastern countries, 
for films, you have to get your script approved first, and then you go shoot your documentary or your film. And when, you, when your work is finished, you send it for approval for, for, re for release. And if you decide not to do any of that, you are completely um, covered. That is uh, one thing. One other important thing is that censorship differs of like what is sticky, what is tricky, differs from, from uh, culture to, to another. And we were talking about this uh, earlier with Ghada and, 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 and the group, for example. In the Middle East, in Lebanon, particularly in the 50s and, and 60s, very often most of the boys, most, most of the kids are photographed naked because it's a, it's a way to be proud of the fact that you have um, um, a male son as opposed to a, a girl. So every family, almost every family, would have a portrait in a studio, in a commercial studio, the boy opening uh, his legs, showing his genitals. And it's, I mean, these are not considered, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're not eroticized images, or at least they're not considered as eroticized images. In 1998, I did a project taking, taking, taking uh, these pictures as a, as a model for doing the same poses with adults. And all of a sudden, like you see, like in the Middle East, people would be uh, really, um, would see it awkward to see a, a man uh, opening his legs and showing his genitals, but would not see that, uh, see that as an odd thing for a boy. Once I sent um, the little publication to Belgium for, to, be, to be sold, and the bookstore was shocked and said, no, we, we don't show, uh, we, we, we don't, yeah, in Belgium, <laughs> we don't show or we don't accept to sell um, uh, publications with images of naked children. So here's a completely different uh, um, context. But you said also this morning when you know, we looked at the title of these three panels and you saw gender in, in the panel that we should rather talk about sex than about gender? Yeah, I think there are enough uh, non-governmental organizations in the Middle East working under the title of gender, which is more about identity politics, sexual identity politics. I think we live in a, uh, in, in a place where sex is, sex is not even uh, accepted or is, uh, is not accepted to be addressed um, in public, although it, is, it takes place in the public sect, uh, sphere, but uh, in, the, in the private sphere, but it, um, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a kind of um, uh, pudeur um, uh, to, to uh, um, that people don't like to talk publicly about their sex life, and when they hear others talking about their sex life, they get annoyed. It has to do with the, it, with, the, with the Arabic society, maybe. I don't know. It has to do with, um, um, with the Middle East. And the laws are derived to, um, to protect this. So I think we should start talking about sex before starting to talk about identity politics. Do you agree with that? But we, 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 we speak about sex. Remember the video we saw in, within a religious context. So we can speak about sex if uh, the prophet or uh, said, like, this is how you should uh, have sex. So this we can talk about it. But sure, sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think uh, I never heard speak about sex so much than in the Middle East. I mean, in a society in which you try to forbid some, something, people develop maybe in an underground way all the... And what, it, what is interesting in the... In the I mean, in, at that point, is that is that is not only in the outward of the Middle East. This is very popular that people in the Middle East speak all day long about sex. Actually, it was very very interesting to see that YouTube thing this morning because we all of a sudden went on YouTube and uh, looked at this amazing film. Yeah, that uh, that was a TV program that we watched this uh, this morning on YouTube, showing um, uh, an Egyptian TV presenter reading passages from um, um, a book. Uh, that tells how you should treat your wife on the wedding, on the first wedding night. And it goes, it was too explicit that the presenter could not even read some of the passages. He would say, like, you know what I mean by his hand was inserted there. And it, the, the thing is that this is like your first wedding night. People don't want to hear about extramarital affairs or about people having sex outside marriage or people of the same sex having sex of course, you hear about that among friends in the popular um, uh, conversations, but these conversations are n never get the legitimacy of, uh, uh, of um, the public sphere, in my opinion. Like there is this beautiful Arab proverb which say, do whatever you want, but don't tell to anybody. 
I, I think this is Egyptian. <laughs> now, let's move on to war. Um, we were also uh, wondering, uh, in terms of uh, going through all these topics the previous panels have, um, have addressed, and uh, it was interesting also to see, obviously, I mean, Akram, you said in terms of war, in terms of having a very direct uh, uh, confrontation, that that is obviously something which always played a very, very major role in, in the work. Uh, so maybe we could start with you. Well, I mean, uh, I'm a kind of artist who are very much concerned with uh, his uh, social, uh, political entourage. So it's inevitable when you live in a country that is tormented by war, that have gone through a series of invasions from, from many um, armies and withdrawals and then invasions a second time. So it's inevitable not to talk about war. I think it would be f falsifying things to, uh, uh, to shy away from that subject. But of course, my work is not restricted to this. I've I have basically three axes in my work, uh, an, an interest in sexual practices, an interest in um, photographic documents and stu the study of uh, um, um, the history of those photographic practices. And the third one is uh, territorial uh, uh, conflicts, invasion, the, uh, uh, having this question like what happens uh, to a territory that have been invaded several times um, uh, and that have un undergone w withdrawals of these um, uh, invasions. So for me, like if you do an excavation in uh, if you look, if you do an archaeological excavation in a in a volcanic, um, I mean, in, in a city was tormented once by a volcano, it's inevitable to touch on uh, on, on this level. If you if you do a, an excavation in the desert, it's inevitable to encounter so and so and so. So it, it, I do excavations, and it's for me inevitable to touch on the subject of war in Lebanon. Akada, you said that very often if one looks at uh, war, uh, maybe um, it's the moment just before the war. I mean, we talked about uh, certain moments in history, you know, mentioning, we are mentioning Berlin in the 20s, the kind of uh, moments just before the war. Could you talk a little bit about what, what you meant with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've always been fascinated by how, how many avant-garde movements have uh, been developed before war. I mean, if we think about uh, Bauhaus or constructivism, and, uh, and I think, in a way, art and war have to do together. One of them is the consequences of, of the other. And uh, because during war, uh, obviously, it's very difficult to develop, uh, uh, not our project. I mean, we know that Guernica was a, a painting made after the, the bombing of the, of, the, of the village of Guernica. But I've, I'm very fascinated by this, this issue. And actually, Akram did say something interesting this morning also. He said that in Lebanon, it's the contrary. <laughs> you know? He said that uh, art came after the war. I liked this very much. So uh, art before the war, uh, art after the war. Gada, what's your view? I'm not a specialist of war. <laughs> Just sex. <laughs> right? Actually, people said that... <laughs> Um, uh, during a war, people have more sex than... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but is it censored in or Lebanon. not censored? <laughs> I don't know. Like, uh, like, for example, in 2006, when a major part of the Lebanese population were, were, were displaced from South Lebanon and lived in Beirut, and there were many organizations active in, in, in their service, so they kind of um, uh, installed many families uh, in schools, in parks, in tents, etc., and they used to um, uh, check for their needs, and many, many, are like old people wanted really sexual stimulants, wanted, <laughs> and it's funny to... Uh, well, I, I, think I think that uh, generally we have sex after war, but uh, after, war? after, you know, the rest. The rest of and, the men uh, who didn't kill? No. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is, all, especially in America, in, in the post-war uh, abstract art that came just after the war, I don't know. I think there's How something. How do you know this? How do you know this? Sex? Yes, after the, the war. Sex? <laughs> the sex? The post-war? Yes. Now, before we open it to the floor for all your questions, there was maybe uh, one last chapter uh, to cover, uh, which, uh, uh, because I think it's kind of uh, important, uh, we felt, in terms of this panel, that it's uh, 
three artists very often when these discussions happen about the, um, the Middle East. We've got panels of curators, panels of museum directors, and it's a rare occasion to have three artists. So we felt it's important to maybe also address the view um, uh, of uh, uh, your view on the art institution in the 21st century, because we live in a moment where actually a lot of new museums are built in uh, um, the region uh, we now no longer call the Middle East in search for a neologism. Um, so more and more uh, museums are built, and um, it would be interesting to hear from you uh, in terms of the 21st century institution, what would be kind of your ideal museum or your musée imaginaire? Uh, and maybe also interesting in relation to the fact that uh, a different type of institution could maybe happen from the institution which exists in the West. No, this idea that, uh, as Edouard Glissant always said, at the moment when we have a polyphony of art centers and museums pop up in this polyphony of art center is an extraordinary opportunity not just to copy Western type of museums or Western type of art institutions, but produce difference. So maybe, Carla, would you start? I mean, uh, what, what is interesting in the, the reference you said about Edouard Glissant is the idea that the museum um, is a space that has to be reappropriated. And uh, because we all know today that uh, the, the evolution of museum is directly toward the super mall um, uh, aesthetic and ethic. And I think that maybe, I mean, it's just a suggestion. I'm an artist, I'm not a, an historian, but. I would like to see that maybe the, the museum of the future will be a museum without any art pieces, which will make more sense to, to, to care about the world. You mean a museum without objects, ways beyond objects? Yeah, without objects. I mean, there are very, very interesting buildings of museum that can be seen only as architecture. Can I watch your uh, museum imagine? No, a museum without objects is not a museum, no? <laughs> No, I like, I, I kind of have a problem with, okay, as if the way you present it, as if the, the Western model has failed and now we are going to construct an Eastern model uh, that is going to be much better in the, in, the, in the East. It's a kind of a little bit orientalistic idea to think that we are going to repair all of the failure of the West in a new land and this new land is going to be the East. So I have a, already a problem with that because I think that there is a lot of um, a, a good models in the West uh, that I like. I like an, a, a museum, uh, like the model of the museum is not, is not something that is, ex it's, it's uh, an institution, public institution who, has, who collects objects for a public, you know? So it, this is, uh, um, and I don't mind to, to continue that. Uh, of course, uh, this is, but I, I just wanted to, to, to say this. So my imaginary museum, after saying this, <laughs> would be in Cairo, <laughs> not in Dubai, not in Abu Dhabi. And um, I will start it myself. <laughs> See? And I will convince, try to convince a lot of rich Egyptian, if I find. It's all imaginary, right? So I will try to convince <laughs> a lot of like the rich. I like the idea actually very much um, of the, um, uh, the like, I don't like the idea of the museum like in France, for example, where it's the government who hires the, the people who, who buys for, for um, I prefer like some people if they, the, the donation or rich people who has a board and this board chooses. I think this is a better at least um, approach than a government who gives money to a museum and then you have people who go and buy and they think they are buying from their own money so they have all of this power structure that it's a little bit annoying. But, so I, I'll, I'll keep that. And Akram? I think uh, it has to do with the idea of nationhood. I think nations start with a, uh, with a flag and would love to f go through a museum or like go through a stage of, of, of a museum. It's, I, I mean, in a way, I agree with Kader that there's, we've seen the limits of, um, of um, a Western museum. We've seen the limits of, um, of a gallery space inside a museum. We've seen the limits of the building of a, in, in, in an idea of a museum. And this is why it's a little bit weird for me to see that museum starts with a building. So uh, I, 
I would join Kader on imagining a museum with no objects and a, muse a museum with no building at the same time. And let's see how this can, could operate. And a so, curator, how would you imagine this? There would be no, no curators, maybe. I but don't you mean know. no? Just no. that we are and imagining. And the director of the museum, how would it be? <laughs> you we mean are a museum without, uh, without building at all or with no a priori building? Could there be a posteriori I mean, building? Of it could be just an administrative, um, like an office to run the administration and to think, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, to think no. all the time uh, how to exhibit and what to exhibit, if not objects. <laughs> It's an interest. I mean, if, if we look towards the future, I think we should not look for a futuristic schemes for, in terms of design, but futuristic schemes in terms of structures. Um, I'm old-fashioned. I mean, well, we are, yeah, we are old-fashioned. But you, you know why? I think, in, I think in moments of crisis, the first thing that gets to be deleted in terms of budget is culture. And in Europe, I think you are suffering, I mean, they are suffering from that, maybe in the, I, I don't know ab about, uh, about the US. Well, luckily in, in, in the Gulf, I think who's pay, like, uh, it's Abu Dhabi who's paying, for example, so it's, it's the government. So it's, I don't know if these projects will be able to withstand a huge crisis. Now, one very last question, because uh, it's very exciting. We see here images of your recent works and some older works. Now, it's an extraordinary fortunate situation to have you here all present um, uh, in this panel. So it would be obviously wonderful to hear um, uh, about your work now. And uh, my last question was actually if you could tell us about your current project, what you're working on at the very moment. A project we cannot yet see images because it's not yet finished. Gana, can you maybe start? I, I am um, working on two, pro uh, well, three projects. One is um, at Columbia University at the Niemann Center. I am doing uh, collaboration with another uh, artist Iran, from Iran, Reza Farkonde, and I'm doing a new series of uh, uh, drawings and prints. So I just started like three weeks ago. So and it's going to be for the whole year, and so the result will be in May. And uh, April, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, have my first book uh, on all of the aspects of my works. I've been uh, working on this book for four years or three years. So and it's going to be uh, published by Gregory Miller. Um, and uh, I'm working on a new series of painting uh, for May too. Uh, a new, new series of painting, I don't know. I'm trying to push my limits. I don't know if I, uh, I will, we'll see. New paintings <laughs> in May. In cover? Yes. Um, well, I'm working on a project which uh, take part in between Algiers, Paris, and Mumbai, and Delhi also. And actually, it's a, a film project with uh, three transsexuals. And they are, they, have all, they are all more than 50 years old, which means a lot, if we know what's happened in this community the, la the, the last uh, three decades. And well, I don't know, uh, it's the only... Uh, I, I think I'm going to work all the next year on it. Akram, your current project? I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend next year six months in Berlin, and I'll be writing a fiction, a, a film, a feature film. And the feature film is set in Beirut, and it's at the same time a police and a sex story. So it's a story of sex. It's a police sex story. You like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of interesting because in, uh, in all, all the three of you, I, I had this impression actually, uh, also in previous conversation, we have books play a kind of an important role, no? I mean, Lawrence Wiener once said books furnish a room. Books are, are important for all of you. I, I didn't understand. Books. 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 What? I mean, I love books. I think books are nice objects and if you take them seriously, they can stay long. I mean, I have also this, uh, excuse me, Akram, uh, passion for old books. I collect. Which you collect, no? Yeah, yeah, some of them. I, um, I told you before, I have the, the first edition of the, the first um, African uh, who won the Prix Goncourt in France, it, uh, René Maron, with a book named Batwala. And this was in 1921. So this is um, an interesting symbol. Yeah, I like book with images. 
And that's a good moment to open it uh, to the floor. All the questions. I have a question here, yeah. Well, I, I've been to Cairo, and what's, when you talked about the museum, I was thinking about the underground city in Cairo, and that is a museum that's a living museum with no art. Everyone's an artist there, you know, the where? different shops. In Cairo, the, the city that's beneath the streets where they have a synagogue there, and I don't know what you call the area. It's an old, it's the old part of Cairo. Cairo. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's Mar Gerges, maybe? Yeah, it's the... But there are artists? I didn't, I didn't, I'm not trying to... There are no artists there. Oh, it's just so a living there? part of the city. It's just yeah. the... There's some, there's a, some market, and there's a synagogue down there, and it's an old street that's been uh, there since Cairo's, you know, whatever. You mean the city itself is a museum? It's a, it's a, the city itself is a museum, yeah. Uh, so you don't need a museum in Cairo? I'm not going to do my museum? Well, no, no. You could exhibit anywhere along that street. And actually, there's an old synagogue, as I said, there that people still visit and stuff like that. Okay. And then another thing, too, is that we're currently now working at Stanford University on a library without books. So you talk about a museum without books. There are libraries without books. 15% of the people now reading online within Another three years, it'll be 50%, maybe 100%. But books are good. I love, 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 love books, too. OK. Thank you. Anybody wants to comment on this comment? Or otherwise, no? I think, uh, yeah, I, th I think the idea of a library without books is really, uh, I mean, thank you for this comment, because it's true. Uh, museums are also about collections. Museums are also about conservation for a future generation. But not all of them are being thought of in, 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 such a, in such a way. But also when it comes to books, very soon I think books are going to be um, digital. So we're, I mean, of course we're not going to burn the, the hard copies, they're great. But I think uh, providing access will be like um, uh, not restricted to, um, um, to library uh, use. Thanks. Yeah, and actually when I was referring to the idea of museum without uh, art pieces, I was not saying the world without no, no pieces. You know what I mean? I'm not that. And I, I think that the, 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 the issue of the library is the same. And what you said is it's true. I mean, today we are going in this uh, digitalizing era of, 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 of books. And also, it doesn't mean that if a library doesn't have book, outside the libra library, there's no books. So I'm more speaking about this idea of the musée imaginaire. If, if, if the world would be, I mean, the real museum. I see a question here. Yeah. Uh, hello, I wanted to ask whether any of the artists feel like the reception of their work has changed since 9-11. Uh, of course it did. No, it, it did, not the reception. I think it's just put the, the artists from this part of the world on the map. As I, I was saying, it's uh, maybe um, the reception, uh, of, like the, the, peop the people here, they wanted to know more their enemy, so they were more interested in the, in the artists of this part of the world. Well, the reception of my passport has changed at the American Customs <laughs> since uh, 2001. <laughs> This is the most, I mean, obvious for me. And uh, I, I started this work with the transvestite, as you said, in 1988. Well, travel has become really impossible. It's really, really difficult. Um, I don't know. I started working in 94, and the, my first contact with the market was 2005. So I really, I, I mean, I was pr highly productive in the 90s, but I didn't show my work much outside Lebanon. So I can't really answer this question. Yes, there's one more question here. Yeah. Carter Adia had a show at the Henry Gallery in Seattle. During the show, a friend of mine from Uzbekistan, an artist from Tashkent, was visiting. I took him to the show, and he was very excited because he saw possibilities that hadn't occurred to him. He saw something from, in a way, from his cultural world interpreted in a very new way for him. I wonder if any of you can talk about 
increased ties between Central Asian countries and the Middle East, be between artists there and in the Middle East, and, and if you can make any comment about um, how that's stimulating artists in either area. Tough question. Huh? I'm from Africa. I can't answer this question. Maybe but you can answer. I, I didn't get it. I, I didn't, Asia, I didn't get it. You're, you're from Asia. You can answer it. Your, your question is if we have relationships with uh, non -Western, non, other non-Western okay. cultures? Oh, Specifically Central with Central Asia. Central Asia. Central Asia. Yeah. You, you know, which formerly belonged to the Soviet Union. These were republics of the Soviet Union. Mm, and very, it's an area yeah. where there's a resurgence in Islam, and they're dealing with some of these same issues, censorship, um, sexuality, gender, tradition, I mean, restrictions, to, yeah. to freedom. Tell you, to tell you the mm. truth, I, I mean, the way I see it in the Middle East, uh, I think those cities have established uh, uh, links with uh, uh, um, world urban centers, but very often the link to, very, to a very close city is not uh, uh, established. For example, there are, uh, there are very little exchange between Beirut and Tehran, and I discovered Iranian films in Paris or in New York later. I have not, as, 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 I mean, you, you imagine that um, proximity uh, uh, automatically would mean um, um, exchange, but in fact, it is not uh, the case. We live in, in a highly divided area where politics dictate borders and borders dictate no visas. Um, I mean, it's easier for me to, to get a visa to France as opposed to to get a visa to uh, uh, Morocco or Algeria or. Um, or Saudi Arabia, forget it. A tangential movement. I mean, if, if you don't go, um, I mean, if, if the cultural um, basis doesn't allow um, um, mobility and doesn't allow uh, exchange and doesn't allow um, uh, to overcome barriers of language, then it's really um, difficult to... Uh, to establish those links easily. Yeah, I mean, that was also at the forefront of our first panel, which we had done in Basel, um, actually, as part of this Future of the Museum panels, where uh, we reflected in 2006, I think it was, about the art institution in the Middle East, and we had 11 speakers, and many of these speakers had never met each other, because there were just no visas among these countries, so that sort of goes in the same direction, really. As Maureen Nesbitt would say, this is a rendezvous of question marks, so I'm sure there must be somewhere more questions. Yeah, there's a question here. Uh, Gada, recently in your collaborative works, you've been working with Reza, who's a, a gentleman from Iran, and based on looking from your past works, your works are usually dealing with uh, sexuality and oppression of women in the Middle Eastern culture. Now, how does working with a gentleman from Iran affecting your tones of your works and your, maybe your ideals about feminism and kind of the way that uh, you're pursuing this in your imagery together in your collaborations? Well, first, um, it was not by intention that I, we collaborated. It, it was rather by accident, which was a happy accident. So um, uh, this is just the, the first comment. And then uh, the second, I kind of like the idea of collaborating with a man on a subject of uh, uh, sexuality and on a subject of so-called feminism, I, uh, because, not, because it dilutes identity. I have always been had a problem with identity because I don't feel I belong somewhere in particular. I have as well a problem of my feminine identity. Uh, why should I, like, what's the difference between men and women and why should 
men be more successful or should men not address uh, femin feminist issue or feminine is issue. So for me, all of this uh, is very uh, interesting and even more interesting to develop any feminist disco discourse in this direction rather than just, okay, I'm a woman, I have to speak with psychology, I'm gonna do it alone, like all of the, uh, uh, all, like the traditional way, but rather opening and diluting identities between men and women, uh, you know, then, as, because he's Iranian, I didn't choose he's Iranian. He could be Italian, he could, it, it happened like this. So it wasn't, uh, it was better to choose American, for example. It was just a happy accident. <laughs> There's one question here, yes. Um, hi, um, I'm just curious to know your opinion about, like, what would be the, major change that the construction of like the Guggenheim and the Louvre in Abu Dhabi and like all these new museums, well not new museums, but like, the construction of big museums in the Gulf is going to bring like to Middle East artists. This is to me? Yeah. Oh. I, I, I really don't have the details of what's what's taking place, but I think we need to trust those people who are who have been appointed to handle this and wait until they do the action. Obviously, they are they are they are, they are creating collections. My, Not, my, yeah, my problem is is to have the name like Guggenheim here, so Guggenheim there, whatever there, so it's, this is my problem more than really the museum itself. They can do whatever the museum they want and, and, and I like actually the structure of the museums in general, but I have a big problem with just naming, branding. It's like have Channel and Chanel and uh, whatever. I, I, this I have a problem personally with that. And I think that a collection should be built on, over years. It should be part of a culture. You cannot just have a, a uh, an office, a building, and then just fill it with stuff, and then you call it a museum. This is not uh, a museum for me. So I don't know. I've, I've never been there, by the way, so, but I don't know. I can only imagine. Ricardo, do you have a comment? Well, I think, that I, I, in, a, in a way, I'm, I'm, I agree, uh, uh, Gada. And in the other, I think that um, the most important things in regarding the, the Abu Dhabi project and all these kind of export, uh, imported uh, museums is that we back again on the idea of the censorship. Are they going to show only Orientalist paintings of the 19th century and all the pompier art of France that were staying in the storage of Musée du Louvre during years? I hope not. And the other thing is that I hope they will take part of, uh, they, will, they will take care about the, the contemporary art scene of the, of the area, of the, of, the, of the area of Abu Dhabi, of the area of the Gulf. Thank you all very, very much. Many thanks to Gada, many thanks to Kado, many thanks to Akra, many thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.